This amusing cartoon alludes to two of the most dividing things in the world, our interpretations and beliefs. These two groups of soldiers are prepared to fight to the death over whose god is better. What do you see first, a duck or rabbit? Of course, it is neither. It is rather the grouping of lines to reproduce an image and our brain does the rest. The intention of this lecture is for you to be able to express why historians' views differ on the glorious revolution of 1688 and 1689. Knowledge-wise, you will begin to construct the chronology of 1688 to 1701. Skills-wise, analyse the interpretations of history and behaviourally apply this knowledge of interpretations to two extracts in the associated material. The purpose of the historian today is to research and assess evidence found to reach a conclusion based on that evidence. It is no longer to be able to be the oracle of all facts about events in the past. Historians need to consider five key concepts. Cause, consequence, continuity and change, similarity and difference, and significance when looking at the past. There is no doubt, therefore, that whatever the historian states to be their findings will be clouded by their own ideological makeup. This is a given. There is no need to state this fact. What is important, especially for you as the student of history, is the consideration of why the historian believe their judgment is the key reason, the most important factor or criteria when looking at the past. You have to remember that all interpretations of the past are formed by the viewpoint of its author caused by the socio-economic factors around them. However, you are not expected to know the background of every historian you come across. What you are looking out for are obvious times when a historian's view of the past has been clouded by their prism of the present. When historical hindsight seeps in and muddles their objectivity. Therefore, when you review any historian, and that includes me as your teacher, consider these basic questions. 1. Is the author actually given an interpretation or are they simply stating facts? Are they using evidence to back up their view or are they just telling you what happened? All outcomes must be based on the telling of evidence. Secondly, is the interpretation based on generalizations or is it backed up by evidence? Does the historian make wide general statements about events, individuals or groups? Thirdly, does the historian make clear the methods they have used to arrive at their interpretation? Has the historian made it clear what criteria they are using to reach their judgment? How is the evidence they are using forming their ideas? Do any other interpretation, finally, agree with the one given? Plus, does anyone else agree with them? If so, how many? Is this an orthodox interpretation? or something new. You will not necessarily be able to answer all of these questions, but certainly questions 1, 2 and 4 can be asked of any extract which comes your way. The events of 1688 were put into motion in 1688 when James II's wife, Mary of Medina, gave birth to a son. In most cases, the birth of a son would bring joy and harmony to the nation. However, this son was a Catholic. However, this had to be brewing far longer. In April 1687, James issued a declaration of indulgence and attempted to repeal the test act, causing backlash from the political nation. When James II attempted a second declaration, seven bishops refused to have the declaration read out, therefore disobeying the king. In May 1688, the seven bishops on trial were acquitted to public rejoicing. The baby Prince James was a bridge too far. With only Protestant daughters, many were prepared to wait for James II to die, but now a Catholic succession was assured. Seven key figures, known as the Immortal Seven, 
wrote to William of Orange and invited him to bring a force to fight James and claim the throne of England in the name of his wife, Mary, James II's eldest daughter. It is very easy and a little simplistic to label the event as a popular uprising against the deeply unpopular Catholic monarch James II. There is far more to it than that. Money, power, religion, loyalty and enmity wrapped up in the events of 1688. Nevertheless, it cannot be denied that religion was a key trigger for these events. However, being a trigger does not make it the most important reason. For example, the Whigs, promoting John Locke's view of a constitutional monarchy with a strong and powerful parliament limiting the power of the king, was at the forefront and the religious issues were used to promote that. For the Tories, however, unlike the Whigs, who were against powerful monarchy, supported monarchy. They had to find a way to contradict their belief and support a passive obedience. The unquestioning obedience to the authority of a monarch, even when the monarch abuses that power. Historical interpretations of the Glorious Revolution tend to focus on a number of key themes. For example, most traditional interpretations accept that the Glorious Revolution came about due to a foreign invasion and was not instigated by the native population of England. The traditionist Thomas Macaulay, a 19th century historian, stated the revolution was bloodless and contrasted with the French Revolution, concluding it was the least violent revolution in history. Macaulay also believed that the revolution was a result of a moderate consensus between Whigs and Tories to overthrow the king. Marxist historians, such as Christopher Hill and Lawrence Stone, see the revolution as a basic continuation of the bourgeois revolution of 1649, in which the propertied and landed classes overthrew a monarch who was restricting their economic growth. Therefore, for Marxists, the revolution was for the benefit of the propertied moneyed classes. The most current view, which is that of the revisionists, such as John Morrill and Edward Valance, build on the consensus of Whigs and Tories and label the revolution as a sensible revolution. Many also overturn the label of bloodless by exploring the outcomes of the Glorious Revolution and the William Knight War and Jacobite uprisings as a result of the revolution and therefore very violent, especially in Ireland and Scotland. Now let us remember what is meant by passive obedience. This is when there is unquestioned obedience to the authority of a monarch, even when the monarch abuses their powers. In other words, you do nothing to restrict the monarch simply because they are the monarch. The historian Tim Harris outlines the reasons why some Anglican Tories felt compelled to oppose James II. He says, To appreciate the logic behind Tory Anglican non-compliance, we have to be clear about two key doctrines the doctrine of passive obedience and the maxim that the king could do no wrong. Although one was supposed to yield obedience to the king in all things that were agreeable to God's commands, the church had always held that if the king commanded something that was contrary to God's law, one had to obey God rather than man. One should not commit an immoral act even if commanded to do so by the king, nor should one violate one's oaths, since perjury was a sin as well as a crime, or go against one's conscience. Nevertheless, one could not resist the king, and one had to accept whatever punishment was meted out for non-compliance. For us, the fellows of Magdalen College had no option but to stand up to James II, but they also accepted the consequences, namely ejection from their fellowships. This was a classic example of the application of the principle of passive obedience, although in modern day parlance it might more accurately be styled passive disobedience. The intention of this lecture was for you to be able to express why historians view differ on the Glorious Revolution of 1688 and 1689. Knowledge wise, you have begun to construct the chronology of 1688 to 1701. Skills wise, you have begun to analyse the interpretations of history. And behaviourally, 
you are beginning to apply this knowledge to interpretations in extracts 